So I know you've heard it. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. How's it spell? Oh, that was slow. You're 1115. You should have that. R-E-S-E-P-C-P. Let's try it again. R-E-S-P-E-C-T. And I don't get no respect. Who said that? Well, can I say to you that if you happen to have four legs, maybe you only have two legs, and you walk in or onto the property of the Sophias and the stars, you will be met by a creature that has no respect for you at all. You can play dead all you want, and she will bring you into the house and introduce you to the rest of us. So this morning, you know, I, I have my quiet time every morning. I don't miss very often. It's one of the disciplines that I have placed in my life and never regretted a moment of it. And I had finished my quiet time and as upstairs getting ready, and I hear our daughter say, Dad, yeah, uh, Gemma brought a friend into the house. Um, yes, and I'm thinking, now what creature did she bring into the house? And, um, and it's a lot bigger than the last creature she brought into the house, which I think was a baby from this herd or litter or whatever you call them. And there it was. Now, the worst part about it was it was still alive. And I'm thinking, OK, how do we wrap this thing up and take it outside? So what do you do when you don't know what to do? You grab it by the tail and it just spins around and bites you. No, I just took it by the tail and took it outside and put it on the porch. And Gemma wanted to go out. <clears throat> So I let her go out for a second, brought her back in the house. She's in the house. I lock her in, and it scampered off. It was still alive. So thank God she wasn't a murderer two times in a row, <laughs> just once. So just warning you that oftentimes we give respect when Gemma won't. If you come visit us, just letting you know ahead of time. So our text is in Genesis chapter 50, but this morning we're actually going to start with Genesis chapter 59 because these five verses set the context for Genesis chapter 50, which is the last chapter of the book of Genesis. And this is what we read. Then Jacob gave directions to his sons. Now I always find this interesting, this play in words between Jacob and and Israel. You know, Jacob is Jacob until he's about 100 years of age, 97 to be exact, and he wrestles with the angel of the Lord and God changes his name. So from there on out, there's this interplay between names. So it says, and Jacob gave directions to his sons. Now, when Jacob prophesies, he does so with the name of Israel the name that God had given him in the last two decades of his life. He said, I'm about to join the members of my family who have already, help me out, died. Sound like you had died. <laughs> Let's try it again. Who had already died. It's still not there. The, 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 the volume meter isn't still there. Come on, get on board with me. All right, family members who had already died. Listen, I know you don't want to say the word, but you got to say it with enthusiasm because one day you're going to die. All right, and you're saying to yourself, I don't want to die, that's awful. Hey, it's actually a very encouraging truth that you're going to die. And you're going to see it because if you don't, you're really in trouble. So let's go on. So bury me with them in the cave in the field of Ephron the Hittite. Abram had bought it as a place where he would bury his wife's body, Sarah. 
The bodies of Abram and his wife Sarah were buried there. So were the bodies of Isaac and his wife. I also buried. Keep going. I also buried Leah's body there. And Abraham bought the field and the cave from the Hittites, continuing the read. So when Jacob had finished telling his sons what to do, he pulled his feet up into his bed, reading with me, and died. Now, for over 40 years, I have officiated funeral services. In those funeral services, I have given these three points. I don't believe I've missed one funeral service where I didn't share these three points. Now, these three points, interestingly enough, are found on the epitaph of a rather famous person who lived just 20, 25 minutes from us by a car. If we were to cross the Benjamin Franklin Bridge, we would meet a rather famous person whose name is... Yes, all six of you knew it, and I gave you the hint. I said the Benjamin Franklin Bridge. I could have said Walt Whitman, then you would have had to say Walt Whitman. But it, was, it is Benjamin Franklin. Now, on his epitaph, here's the tomb. You will see that. And this is the epitaph. In this epitaph are three profound biblical truths about death. And the first is this. Here lies the body. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 tells us, it's appointed unto man once to die. Everybody has to die. Say that with me. Everybody has to die. Isn't that exciting? Oh, yeah. Now, some of you have enough Bible knowledge to be dangerous. And you're saying... What about Enoch and Elijah? They didn't die. Enoch was not, for God took him, and Elijah went to heaven in a fiery chariot. We'll address that another time, but may I say to you, they died. We'll get back to it. Now, the second truth is a little more exciting. It says it will reappear. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us there is a bodily resurrection. In other words, there's life after death. Now, the third truth is, says that that body, when we have that resurrection, face our creator. Now, that could be an encouraging truth. That could be an exciting truth. Or maybe it isn't such an encouraging truth. Depending on the condition you're in when you meet your creator. Now, atheists and agnostics may deny there's life after death. But may I say to you clearly, the Bible and the cycle of life, say that with me, the cycle of life tells us there is life after death. Because if indeed that cycle of life and the word of God wasn't true, none of us would be here today. Think about it. What did Samaj say to us in the proclamation? The first service, he said, just stop for a moment. Take a deep breath. Come on, let's do it. Exhale. That in itself is a miracle. The fact that today you breathe in air. Think about it. Just think about your body for a second. That this body here in these hands are thousands upon thousands, if not millions, of little veins in which blood runs through, that your body extracts oxygen from, and it keeps you alive. There's absolutely no way when we look at mankind and creation that we can say there is not a God. There is a God. And every man has to die. There is a bodily resurrection. At that resurrection, we face our creator. And we live forever. Say that word with me. Live forever. 
forever. That's the plan of God. Somehow we screw it up. We think, we think, oh, wow, God will fit into my plan. No, you should thank God he's that you be a part of his plan. It's his plan for the universe. And we are honored and privileged enough to be a part of it. And the church said, Amen. okay, so today we're going to use a little different word. We're going to say, I've got it. Try it. Got it. Come on. Got it. And the church said, got it. now, when we face death, oftentimes cultures, um, different races, you know, different languages, they um, celebrate or commemorate death in a different way. Some do it stoically. Some are very emotional. Some will weep bitterly. Others won't weep at all. Some will express joy knowing that his or her loved one is in heaven. And some will express relief because a loved one has suffered long and hard. Some, they don't do anything. They simply take the body, have it cremated, put it in an urn. There's no service. Others have the body cremated, scattered over the ocean, or take it to the mountains. They don't make a celebration out of it or even a commendation out of it. It just sits. Now Joseph responds in a rather unique way. The Bible says that when Jacob had pulled up his knees, breathed his last, that Joseph fell on the body of his father Jacob, wept and kissed him. So, as I mentioned, I've been officiating funeral services for quite a while. And I, I, I'm just, on my video screen, I'm seeing so many different reactions to death. I remember the first funeral I went to as a kid, and one of our family members screamed at the top of her lungs, right in the funeral home, I'll never see her again, I'll never see her again, I'll never see her again. It just cut through me like a knife. And then others, I'll see wives or husbands or children, and they'll do what Joseph did. They'll lay on their mom or their dad, and they'll kiss them. And sometimes I feel that's a little weird, like you're kissing. There's, there's no life in that body. It's, it's just a corpse, not to be disrespectful. But the spirit is who we are. And, but that's what Joseph does here. He, and he weeps. Look at this, Genesis chapter 50 verse 1, and Joseph threw himself onto his father's body and he wept over him and he kissed him. And Father, if I may, I lift up to you the congregation of Lion of Judah. I lift to you Eliezer, who has lost his wife, this battle to cancer, and so quickly. Father, today, as that congregation comes together, they, were, they will be mourning and there will be tears shed, tears of sorrow, and at the same time, tears of joy. Be their comfort, Jesus. And for this service, for those who have yet to enter in, and should they not breathe tomorrow, don't know where they'd be. May this be the day of their salvation. And the church said, Amen. no, the church said, now, because Joseph weeps over his dad and kisses him, does that mean that he loved his father any more than his brothers? The Bible doesn't tell us how the brothers responded, but that doesn't mean that we don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Just stay with me for a moment. I'm not discrediting Joseph's love for his father. Joseph is demonstrating both the intensity of his love and the bitterness of his sorrow in losing his dad. Last week, um, a, a good friend of our family and a part of this church um, came up to me after church, and she was literally in tears. 
They had lost their pet dog. It was tearing her up. Now, if I hadn't lost a pet dog the way this family had lost their pet dog, I may not have understood that. But they had to put the dog down. And that is so difficult. Um, we owned ch Chow's for 30 years, and two of them we had to put down. I can still see Bruiser to this day in Pittman Animal Hospital holding his huge face and watching him die in my hands. It was just, uh, I, I still see it. It's as real as could be. It's as painful as could be. So I understood this young mother's feeling. And we stopped and, and, and we prayed together. There are times in the church that I'm overwhelmed as we sing. You know, we're worshiping the Lord in song and I'll just raise my hands and I'll worship the Lord. But does that mean I love God any better than the person who could be standing next to me that doesn't raise their hand? No, it doesn't. It's just the way I express myself at that moment, the way the Lord moves through me at that moment. That doesn't mean that the person on the left of me or the right of me or somewhere else in the balcony, wherever they are, doesn't love, that, that doesn't love God as much as I do. Maybe they actually love him more. They just don't express it the same way. So we have to be careful that we don't project the way we do something onto someone else to make them feel like, in a sense, guilty because why aren't you raising your hands? Why aren't you shouting? Now, if somebody came in the door with a rifle and says to Josh, hey, Josh, you have a choice. You either recant your faith or you're a dead man. And they look at me and they point a gun at me and say, all right, Bruce, either you recant your faith or you're a dead man. And I'm going to be the good guy here, Josh. You're going to be the bad guy. I'm just letting you know that right up front. And Josh should say, shoot, I ain't giving. I'm not dying for my faith. Are you kidding me? And he gets all scot-free. And I, on the other hand, say, I'm not giving up my faith and I die on the spot. Who loves God more? Only three of you know that answer? <laughs> Goodness. It would clearly be, it's not a black and white. It would clearly be that if I'm willing to die for my faith, I love God more than the person who doesn't or is not willing to die for their faith. Now, and the church said, thank you. Oh, man. I'm like working to death up here and you're like staring at me like I don't exist. Like, uh, oh, or did you die, Pastor? No, I'm wondering if you died out there. All right. <laughs> then Joseph talks to the doctors. Now say that word, the doctors. the doctors. It's important to the text, the doctors. Say that again. The Who served him. And he told them to prepare the body of his father Israel to be buried. So the prepared it. Now they took 40 days to do it. They needed that time to prepare a body in the right way. And then the Egyptians mourned Jacob for 70 days. So that's a long time of mourning. I don't know of anyone who sets aside 70 days to mourn anybody, not least in the day in which we live. But in this instance, you got to understand, they didn't start viewing the body of Jacob till after 40 days because the doctors were preparing his body for 40 days. So it's 40 days of preparation. Then it's 30 days of mourning. Um, <laughs> I had a somewhat of a pastor friend who, um, when his wife died, 30 days later, married somebody else and just took off. And when he was asked about it, he said, my 30 days of mourning are over. And he married somebody, and I noticed, noticed he didn't stay in the state of New Jersey. 
because his wife's family would have killed him before in less than 14 days. But you, you get the point. There should be a time of mourning, and there is. Now, there are three notes of interest about this passage of Scripture. First of all, scholars believe the reason why Jacob was mourned for 70 days is because of the embalming process and the 30 days in which he was viewed. So I thought about this. What happens if I die? And I'm going to, unless God tarries, because so are you going to die unless God tarries. So what would I want you to do, congregation, if I die? First of all, I, I hope my wife and children would give me a viewing. You never know. <laughs> They're allowed to say, give him a viewing? Are you serious? I hope they wouldn't say that. I don't think they would say that. But I hope you would mourn at least one day. If you want to mourn a day and a half, that's fine. I hope you shed some tears. Tears of sorrow that I'm gone. You got this, Cassie, you better. Tears of sorrow when I'm gone, and then tears of joy that I'll be in heaven. And after that, just forget it, because I'm having a good time, all right? Move on with your life, that's all. You don't have to remember me for 70 days. If you did, you'd really be in trouble. Just, just shed tears, shed more tears of joy, and we're on our way. And the church said, good. Now, I don't know if that's what I'm going to write in my will, though my will is done. I may change it and say, I want the church to come see me for 30 days every day. No, I won't. <laughs> so the word for doctor here is healer. Now, this is fascinating because the doctors in, Israel, in, 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 in uh, Egypt, these physicians were specialists. There were no family physicians. No one could practice anything other than their specialty. So every doctor had a specialty. And that specialty was considered sacerdotal. That means it was sacred. It, it was almost a part of the priesthood. And they were believed to be healers. If it was vision, there was a doctor that specialized in vision. You know, if there was a sciatic nerve, there's a doctor who specializes in a sciatic nerve. And they supposedly had the power to heal you. That was the position of the doctor in the Egypt culture. Now, there's one other note of interest. Jacob was embalmed by doctors. Why wasn't he embalmed? By the embalmers. My brother-in-law is a funeral director. He embalms bodies. That's who you would expect to embalm a body. You wouldn't expect the doctor to embalm a body. So why did the doctors embalm Jacob and not the embalmers? Because embalmers could not embalm someone who wasn't an Egyptian. And since Jacob was a Hebrew, they could not embalm him. So the doctors, the healers, embalmed him. And it says, after the days of sadness, see, those of you listening to, on Facebook or watching on Facebook, you just learned something, as I did in my preparation for this study. <laughs> it says here, and after the days of sadness had passed, Joseph went to Pharaoh's officials and he said to them, if you are pleased with me, speak to Pharaoh for me. Tell him, my father made me give my word. I am about to die. Bury me in the tomb that I dug for myself in the land of Canaan. So let me go there and bury my father, and then I will come back. Doesn't that seem a little odd to you? I mean, let's not forget, Joseph is the ruler of Egypt. He answers to Pharaoh, but he is running the entire country of Egypt. He is the prince of Egypt. He only answers to Pharaoh and pretty much in regards to what he doesn't eat and Pharaoh does eat. So why would he? Why would Joseph send a liaison to go speak to the person who he's worked with and served for years. That doesn't make sense, would it? 
I mean, here he is working side by side with the king of Egypt, and when his father dies, he sends somebody to ask him, can I take my father's body back home? Now, here's what most scholars believe, because we don't know what the answer is. Remember when Joseph was in prison and the baker said, or was it the cupbearer, whichever one lived, said, oh, there's this guy in prison. I'm so sorry, I forgot. Like, he can interpret dreams. So Pharaoh says, clean him up, shave his beard, cut all the hair off of his head, shave it, and bring him before me. So what most people believe is that Joseph, out of respect for his father and for the Hebrew culture, who is taking him back to uh, Canaan, grew a beard and grew his hair out. And therefore, he couldn't enter the presence of Pharaoh. It's a matter of R-E-S-P-E-C-T, respect. Look at it. Remember this picture? Where does that come from? Only six of you have seen the Ten Commandments? Oh, my gracious. I am old. Look, that's Moses right there, Charlton Heston. And there's Yul Brenner. It's a famous haircut. People would shave their heads, wear a little earring, and it was called a Yul Brenner. That is why most scholars believe Joseph could not enter the presence of Pharaoh because it would be disrespectful. So if I may take the next 10 minutes or so, I'd like to address the subject of respect. Now, I could be wrong. It won't be the first time and it won't be the last time. But my observation of society is this. As our culture loses God's priority in it, I'll give you an example. When I was a teen and polls were taken, 70, somewhere between 67, 72 percent of Americans said, that religion had a significant influence in their life, that the church had a significant influence in their life. The most recent poll just came out about a week ago, said that the church and religion have about a 28% rate of influence in our culture. Is it any wonder why we're where we are? Because when God's word loses its final authority for faith, life, and the practice thereof, then every man does what is right in his own eyes. And we lose, what is the word? Respect. So let me share with you a few verses. Stand up in the presence of the elderly. Come on. All right, let's try it again, right? We're reading the score. You ready? You ready? Yes. All right, let's read it. So, my point isn't to in any way say something derogatory or disparaging about any age group. But sometimes I'll take a ride on the train, go up into New York City, wherever it is. And uh, I'll be sitting on the train and these younger people, they take their seats. And somebody gets up and they're a little older and they get on the train and they've got a cane and they're standing there and they're holding on to the pole. And I'm thinking, well, you get out of the seat and give that older person a seat because that's what I did. But you know what? I, again, it's not my point to be um, condescending. It's all in the training. See, it's all in the training. And God has clearly said we should respect the ages. Now, I want you to see why. Let's look at the rest of the verse. 
Fear your God. Come on. I'm the Lord. So why does he want us to stand in the presence of the aged? Is there anybody older than God? No. So he's saying, as you stand in the presence, understand this. This is what respect is about. As you stand in the presence of someone older than you, in, in essence, you're standing in my presence. Respect. Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother. Then you will live a long, full life in the land. And the Lord your God is that the Lord your God is giving you. Sometimes... I'll see people whose lives weren't that righteous. And we know they weren't that righteous, but they live into their 90s. And I say, why did they live into their 90s? And someone who I thought was righteous didn't live as long as they should have. And I have to say, I wonder, uh, this, you know, this is a promise given in the Ten Commandments. I wonder if it's because that man or that woman honored their mother or father. Regardless of the life they lived, they honored their mother and their father. You know, this year, I was asked to officiate the wedding of a lovely young Indian couple. The bride's parents were Christians. The groom's parents were Hindu. Now, the groom and the bride struggled to find the balance between the testimonies of their faith, while at the same time not disrespecting their parents. It wasn't an easy task. It, wasn't. it was like months. How do we do this? But I believe that they found the balance. I remember some time back, um, back, in fact, we were in the theater and a person said to me, Pastor, how do you honor a parent that you don't respect? The Bible says honor our parents, but how do I honor a parent I don't respect? So I put together a pamphlet. How do you honor a parent you don't respect? And if you'd like it, it's free. You can pick it up at the Welcome Center in the main lobby. And may I also take this moment to let you know that John and Gina are teaching a seminar on parenting on October the 8th at 7 o'clock. So I would encourage those of you who are parents, that's probably the majority of you, some younger, your children are younger, some are a little older, but keys to create a faith-shaping home. You've been sitting for a while, let's stand. I'm going to look at a couple more verses. So don't rebuke an older man but exhort him as a father. Uh, younger men as brothers. Older women as mothers. Younger women as sisters. And in all cases, with all purity. And then 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5 tells us this. In the same way, you who are younger... Now notice he doesn't put an age on younger. So it just means if you're younger than somebody else, you're younger. So nobody's exempt. Whether you're 8, 11, 101. If somebody's older than you, you're the younger. Accept authority of the elders. And all of you, dress yourselves in humility. I, I, I like the old English. It says cloak. It's like you have to put it on because it's not natural to you. Cloak yourself in humility as you relate to one another. Remember what Samaj said about his classrooms? Some professors have a degree, some don't have a degree. I remember H.B. London. He said, uh, actually, no, it was, um, I was a guest speaker at Thomas Road. Why won't his mind, his name come to me? But he said, degrees are like pigtails. They don't add a pound to the hog. <laughs> and sometimes that's true, but it doesn't mean we disrespect someone. So it says this, relate to one another. Why? For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Now here's the reality. As teenagers, 
Those of you who are teenagers, can I see your hand just for a moment? There, in the, there we go. Well, look at that. So when you're a teenager, can I tell you, because I was a teenager, there is no one on the planet that's dumber and more stupid than your mom and dad. <laughs> I mean, you just know that. My mom and dad are the stupidest people on the planet. And then something really strange happens. When you get in your late 30s, early 40s, you go, man, mom and dad got smart. What in the world happened to them? <laughs> now, when you're in college and you're challenging everything you've ever been taught, from your faith to the foundations of this country, you know, you think and your professors want you to think that our forefathers and your fathers just screwed it all up. They don't have a clue. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. But whether they're right or wrong, we are to cloak ourselves in humility. We can never go wrong when we cloak ourselves in humility. If my wife wants something from me, all she has to do is be humble, and she'll get it. <laughs> Hi, honey. And she says to me, if you ever want something from me, just try once in a while, cloaking yourself with humility. You are always right. And I say, you're right. <laughs> no, I'm not. So Pharaoh said, go there and bury your father. Do what he made you promise. So they take this trip and they bury the father. It's a huge entourage. I mean, Pharaoh's officials go, highest people in the court. Pharaoh's family goes. Jacob's brothers go, the rest of his family. I mean, this is like huge. This is like, let's go west, young man, go west. They're all heading west. And he did what his father asked him to do. He buries him. Joseph and Daniel are two examples of men who were right, but humbled themselves to those who were wrong without compromising their God-given convictions and found themselves exalted in the end. Now, you may be seated. I'm going to wrap this up. The boss is gone. Say that with me. The boss is gone. What's next? What's next? Come on, say it with a little enthusiasm. The boss is gone. The boss is gone. What's, next? What's next? So uh, I'm going to tell this little story. Uh, Cheryl and I were away on vacation, and we had an office manager, which just happened to be my secretary. And so I, I called the office. And I got the phone machine. And it said, the office is closed. I thought, what? Who gave those instructions? And so I called up the office manager and I said, um, Mrs. A, <clears throat> that wasn't her name, and I won't say it. Yes, I will. No, I won't. <laughs> I said, so why did we shut down the office? And she said, well, you know, I'm just thinking it was a good idea that we could use a break. <laughs> if she was my child, I would have given her Pocky Pockies. You know what they are, right? It's the Board of Education on the Seat of Learning. It's also called an Attitude Adjuster. But I, she was a wonderful person. She really was. So I just have to trust that her judgment was right when I knew it was wrong, but what are you going to do? This is what's so sad about this story. Follow me. So Jacob's dead, and Joseph's brothers think he's now going to get back at them. He is going to get revenge. The boss is gone. What's next? Dad's gone. Joseph is going to get us back for what we did. May I say, the worst thing in the world is to think through guilt. When you see life through guilt, when you think of life through guilt, it will warp everything you see. It's just like an offense. If you have an offense with someone on the platform or the pastor or Sunday school teacher or someone else in the church, you will never see that person the way God wants you to see them because you will see them through that lens of offense or through that lens of guilt. Think about this. 
Here's Joseph caring for them for years, providing for them, seeing that Pharaoh gives them the best of the land. He does everything to say to them, I love you. He does everything to say that you're forgiven. And yet in the back of their mind, because they could not forgive themselves, because they were overwhelmed by this guilt, they could not believe that Joseph could say to them, you are forgiven. Do you realize Joseph is a type of Christ? What is he representing here? Listen, the, uh, 19 and 20, and Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Do you think I'm God? You plan to harm me, but God planned it for good. He planned to do what is now being done. He wanted to save many lives. So then don't be afraid. I'll provide for you and your children. And he calmed their fears and he spoke in a kind way to them. Isn't that the lie of the enemy? He wants you to believe that God's forgiveness is incomplete. He wants you to believe that God is going to get you back for your sins. There is no such thing as karma in God's vocabulary. Now, there is sowing and reaping. But may I say to you that God's grace, Alberto, God's grace is greater than your sin, than your shame, than your stain. And if you're willing to see life through his eyes, then it won't direct what you do next by the lie of the enemy that says live in your guilt and immobilize yourself. Thank you for that solo amen. When I was just, thank you for two. We're getting them now. Listen, I've got 36 seconds to wrap this up. When I was a kid, we would often sing at communion. And especially when somebody gave their lives to Christ, we would sing this chorus. Give me the key for Alberto. Grace, grace. God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all our sins. Stand and sing with me. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon, grace that will pardon and cleanse within grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is grace. Today, will you enter into that grace? It's greater than any shame, any stain, any sin, any guilt. Just enter in. When we won't accept the grace of God, we do exactly what the brothers did to Joseph. We insult his love for us. We insult his grace for us. Don't insult his grace. Don't insult his love. Be a person who embraces his grace for the salvation of sins and for the salvation of many lives. And that includes you. Can we close our eyes? For those of you who have yet to give your life to Christ, why not today? Why not enter into that unconditional love of God the Father through the Son and the Holy Spirit? Pray something like this with me. Say, Father in heaven, I admit to you that I've done things that are wrong. 
So be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me. I believe you love me and you gave Jesus who took upon himself my sin, my shame, my stain, my guilt, my regrets. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Come into my heart. I give you my life.